And when we think about who's being burdened, we're also thinking about who is being impacted by the decisions we're making. Are they at the table as we're making these decisions and asking ourselves these questions? Because the reality is, unless you experience certain things, you don't know that experience. It's just the human nature, right? And so when we don't have certain other people at the table, not just in terms of race, in terms of ability, in terms of language, in terms of immigration status, when we don't have different perspectives in the room, we miss those opportunities to include them. So I'm Rebecca Hurst. I am the Climate Project Manager at Boston Harbor Now. And I'm so thrilled to be welcoming you all here today for this exciting afternoon. Uh, Julie Wormser and Gretchen Rabinkan are going to be kicking us off as uh, two of the co-chairs of the Boston Living with Water Design Competition. So I'll hand it over to them. Um, I'm Julie Wormser. This is Gretchen Rabinkin. And uh, we were part of the team that led the Boston Living with Water Design Competition. How many of you were part of that competition, either as an audience or participant? Terrific. Thank you. Um, everybody who is here today, please pick up or we will pass around um, the book that came out of the competition, which both has the winners and also lessons learned. It's, it's gorgeous and it's hopeful. Um, and it has a lot of great insights for, from the design community in Boston. So today's event is an exciting opportunity to build on the success of the year-long international design competition that we put on to see what Boston would look like when we have five feet more uh, sea level. Um, this was one of many strides that the city and the nonprofit and private communities um, have done in order to prepare for Boston for climate change. Um, can you raise your hand if you're from the city or state? Phenomenal. Um, our, we are incredibly lucky here in Boston to have um, a city and state government that is just way ahead of the curve. Um, not the least climate ready Boston and uh, 100 resilient cities, which you're about to hear from. Um, we did research called Preparing for the Rising Tide. I know um, ULI did phenomenal uh, research living with water. There's been a number of great experts who've all come together uh, in service of our great city. Hi, my name is Gretchen Rabinkin and I'm Director of Civic Initiatives for the Boston Society of Architects and the BSA Foundation. And this is work that we are very committed to and are delighted to be part of as an organization, as well as so many of you who are our members who are really leading the charge in this. Um, we're excited to be here today with you to deepen the conversation, especially with the focus on social equity. The opportunity to bring together the work that Dr. Atiyah Martin is doing as Chief Resilience Officer, as well as the work that the Environment, Energy, and Open Space Department of the City of Boston is doing with Climate Ready Boston, really cuts to the heart of what we hope for, for the future of our city. And that together, we'll be able to create a city that is thriving and resilient for all of our residents. Dr. Tia Martin is the City of Boston's Chief Resiliency Officer, and uh, we're delighted to have you here. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I figure I might as well just start talking to you while they uh, figure out the technical difficulties. How's everyone doing today? Good. So this is an amazing room to look around and see so many familiar faces that I've harassed over the last several months of being in this role as Chief Resilience Officer, as well as some faces I have not had the opportunity to interface with. So welcome. Hopefully I won't scare you today for those who have not engaged with me before. Um, this is a very exciting time for us because actually tomorrow we're having an all-day session with all the different working groups um, across the uh, different resilience themes that have come up as part of the um, engagement work I've done up to this point in order to really get into the weeds around recommendations and really looking at the data in the research. Um, and so some of you who are in this room are actually going to be there, so thank you for your support and commitment. Um, one of the things that um, I think makes sense to talk about is uh, who in the world am I for those people who don't know me. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Atia Martin, and in my role as the Chief Resilience Officer, my ultimate responsibility is to develop the city's resilience strategy. And as part of that resilient strategy, it's not just developing it, it's also implementation. So we transition um, from developing the strategy between uh, 
now, well, between the time I started uh, in August, um, we'll be wrapping up the drafting um, and going into September. And then starting in October, we'll be uh, formally and officially releasing the strategy. And then we'll transition into doing the work. So this is a very unique opportunity for us to really take a process all the way through to implementation in an incredibly short and aggressive amount of time. Uh, it's a little bit scary in some ways. In other ways, it's really lit a fire under many of us um, in order to move the work forward. So one of the things, um, other things I wanted to point out um, was one of the important um, elements of the experience I've had over the last several months since September of 2015, not that long, so it's been, hasn't been that long, um, and we engaged over 2,000 people, um, of many of them in meetings, 164 different meetings across the city uh, within government, within private sector, within um, uh, nonprofits, advocacy groups, um, community organizations, residents, um, and really looking at how do we narrow the scope of all that resilience means. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions because you're going to help me do this. Okay? Okay. No, 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 no. Start <laughs> over. All right. One more time. Y'all are going to help me do this, right? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So. The one of the things um, I'll talk about is what is resilience. So if we are trying to get on the same page about what that means, big picture resilience, the way 100 Resilient Cities talks about it is it is the ability of individuals, organizations, systems, assets to survive, adapt, and grow after emergencies. And they talk about emergencies in two ways. They talk about them in the way we're usually um, used to hearing about emergencies in terms of disasters, those, cr those acute shocks. Right? So that's the natural disasters, that's the terrorism, but they also talk about chronic stresses. And these are the things that are constantly tearing at the fabric of our communities on a regular, ongoing basis. Things like high unemployment rates, things like poverty, things like racism. I know that word makes people uncomfortable. Well, we're going to get comfortable with it because we have some problems that we need to work through associated with racism. Um, we, uh, that also includes um, infrastructure investment or lack of inf infrastructure investment. So all of these different pieces that are ongoing in our communities that in and of themselves can be emergencies and lead to the types of responses that we've seen in recent history. Um, everything from the Minneapolis bridge collapse, which had nothing to do with terrorism or natural disaster and everything to do with maintenance um, and safety requirements all the way over to what's happened in Baltimore, Ferguson, right? Had nothing to do with terrorism, had nothing to do with natural disasters, and everything to do with what was happening in communities on an ongoing, regular basis, and a long history of policies and practices and poor relationships between communities and government, and sp specifically in those cases, police departments. So we know that that's a lot. And that can be everything. So resilient, part of the resilience uh, principles, one of them is really about making sure that we prioritize because we can't do everything. So what are those really big, challenging, what they like to call them, wicked problems? I hear, I go to other places around the country and they're like, it's a wicked problem. I'm like, you got that from Boston. Um, <laughs> but these kind of vexing problems. And so when we think about resilience in a different way, so 100 Resilient Cities is really about when bad things happen, right? So if we think about resilience in terms of what does it look like kind of just every day when we're just living our lives and nothing bad has happened, right? So what are the types of communities that we want to live in? Because really a resilient community is a healthy community. It's the type of community that we all want to live in and that has the things that we want and that we need and that not just meet our very basic needs, but that really are part of us being able to reach our full human potential. So what are those things? Here we go, because remember how excited you were about participating? Yes. So what are some of the things that we want in our communities that make healthy communities? Schools, what kind of schools? Good schools, yes. What else? Yes, sir. Peter said safety, personal safety. What else? Green space, yes. What else? Home and business ownership, transportation. We're getting hot now. Come on. There's more. Jobs. jobs. What kind of jobs? Middle class jobs. Middle class jobs, livable wage jobs, right? What else? Healthy food. 
Healthy food. There we go. What else? Health care, affordable housing. I love it. A couple more things. What else? Connection to neighbors. You get a gold star. We're going to come back to that one. Walkability, right? So we're getting into basic needs as well as the things that are important to us in terms of our ability to enjoy living, right? That quality of life stuff that matters. Those things matter. So if we know that that's what a resilient neighborhood or a resilient city is, then that means the work is to identify what are those biggest barriers between where we are now and the places that we want to live in. What's happening in different neighborhoods that are barriers to having all the things that we just listed. Now I'll tell you, I'll just be straightforward and frank with you that one of them, the main one, is racism. I know, I know, I'm starting trouble, I can't help it. So the first thing to understand is when I say racism, I'm not talking about the common discourse on racism and that there's this racist and you have to find the racist and pluck them out of the environment and move them over here and somehow that makes things better. Because does that work? No, we, we do it all the time. We fire people, we move people over here and over there. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that we've all grown up and we've all been socialized to and exposed to believe certain things about other people. It is the reality of living in any country, living in the United States. So we all have learned some stereotypes about, uh, about other people, right? We could put post-it notes all over this room, which we're not gonna do, so don't be scared, and ask for different stereotypes and all of us could contribute to that, right? I mean, if we're just being honest, right? Stereotypes, we've all learned about them. And what's important about that is those stereotypes, the more we get exposed to them, the more they kind of hover there and are easily accessible and become part of the way we think unconsciously, the way we navigate the world. So think about the difference between when you're trying to do something complicated and you're focused on something versus when you're just walking. Do you think about walking? You just do it, right? Well, for, for those, well, you know. <laughs> In my case, it's a little more complicated. But for the most part, our brain kind of just does it for us, right? We know we want to go and then it just happens, right? And so that is, those are the shortcuts that are very valuable and helpful to us. And they are essential to us as human beings to navigate this world, those shortcuts. We need them because the world is complicated and we need these shortcuts to make life a little simpler. Right? Things that we don't have to focus on. We don't have to think about talking. Right? The words are in our brain and then they come out our mouths. We're not thinking about the actual uh, electrical impulse in our brain and how it navigates and to get the words and da, ya, ya, all that complicated stuff. Right? So the challenge then for us is that people are complicated and these shortcuts don't work in dealing with real people. So our challenge is we have these things we've been taught to navigate the world. Some of them are helpful in terms of th those shortcuts. Other things when it comes to stereotypes and how they get embedded in our brains, how they get embedded in how we navigate society. So uh, movies, music, culture, influences assumptions that we make about other people. This is the reality. It is human nature. It is human nature and all of us have been infected. So no one, not, we're not alone. We are united in that front. We have all been infected by all of these different ways of thinking about other people. And why this is so important and what this has to do res with resilience is very simple. Number one, it impacts the decisions we make in policies it impacts the assumptions we make in order to get to the decisions we make in policies. It impacts the way we engage with people in our communities or don't engage with them. It impacts how we think about design and who deserves what or who should get what or how they should get it or who should be at the table. Who are in the rooms where these discussions are happening and who's not in those rooms. So 
it matters and it matters at a very at those very fundamental levels but it also matters in terms of us thinking about how we prioritize things so social resilience this idea of identifying these inequities that we know disproportionately impact communities of color not because I say so but because the research is very explicit about it pick an issue right um, and so we have this huge challenge that we don't like to talk about this stuff because it's uncomfortable for us and that's normal that it's us uncomfortable for us in fact I like to always go back to the research. It shows that most people have a physiological reaction when the words, word racism or sometimes just the word race is brought up. So it's okay if folks are uncomfortable with that. That is normal. The challenge is how do we get beyond that because the real challenges we face around being successful as a community, as the city of Boston and remaining competitive requires us to figure this out because we are getting more diverse, not less diverse. So if we think about what that means um, for us as a city, that we are getting more diverse, not less, and we still are so uncomfortable having these conversations, our social circles are still so very segregated that we are in this very special place because it's a unique opportunity for us to make some very conscious decisions to combat some things that are very unconscious in the way that we navigate the world and the assumptions that we make about other people even when we don't realize that we're making them and I'll tell you um, one thing that I found incredibly fascinating was that when we look at when we scan a room and we look at a person it takes us one tenth of a second to identify people's race that fast we, we don't even know we're doing it I just find that so fascinating but we navigate through the world um, as if we are in complete and total control and that we ignore that these realities are there in terms of who we are as human beings as part of this being human nature and so when we talk about the resilience strategy it's about not just focusing on social resilience right it's about making sure that it is embedded in all the different ways that we are approaching work in this city because if we do not put people first, we are not doing ourselves and our city justice. We are not doing this work justice, whether we're planners, architects, designers, whatever role that we're playing, if we're not thinking about who the people we're serving and how we're going to serve them. Um, so I'm gonna go backwards. Mandatory 100 resilient city slide. 100 resilient cities, we got money, it pays for me. So this piece, this is kind of where we usually fall down when we talk about resilience. So a lot of times we go immediately to climate change, and that's great because climate change is important. The challenge is when we don't think about the bigger picture. Um, so we have um, also, we think about the economy and critical infrastructure and stuff in the natural environment, we oftentimes forget about people. And because we have these barriers, because we have these assumptions that we navigate the world with, even though we're not always conscious that we're making these assumptions, it determines what we do on this other side here. I've been told I have five minutes, so I have to hurry up. So it determines what we do on this left side of the screen here, right? So when we think about the world of the physical environment and the natural environment that we're always thinking about where people fit in, who is going to benefit, who is not going to benefit, or who's gonna be burdened by the decisions we're making. And when we think about who's being burdened, we're also thinking about who is being impacted by the decisions we're making. Are they at the table as we're making these decisions and asking ourselves these questions? Because the reality is, unless you experience certain things, you don't know that experience. It's just the human nature, right? And so when we don't have other people at the table, not just in terms of race, in terms of ability, in terms of language, in terms of immigration status, when we don't have different perspectives in the room, we miss those opportunities to include them. Unless we have um, navigated that world, it is hard to do it in abstract. And in fact, we tend to go status quo. We tend to go default. We tend to go for what we know in those, in those opportunities. And so we have to be conscious about making sure that we don't do those things, right? That we're always thinking about who's in the room. Do we have an, a diverse group of people in the room? If not, how are we going to go back and make sure that we are doing those things? How do we reach back? And how do we make sure that the voices matter? Um, that's what helps us to continue to move the work forward in a way where we don't continue to make the same mistakes. And so the, the idea here is that we're putting people first. That is the core conversation here is that we're putting people first and we're thinking about 
all types of people, right? And that we're moving in a direction that allows us to create the space for safe conversations, safe um, opportunities to figure out how do we institutionalize ways of, God bless you, institutionalize ways of bringing equity into the discussion, making sure that people get what they need. So I won't get into the resilience principles except to say that they forgot equitable, and so I added that in there. It needs to be equitable, and what does that mean? So I'm gonna come back to that and just be clear. This is the, this is the standard definition for racism. Racism is historically rooted system of power hierarchies based on race infused into our institutions, policies, and culture that work better for white people than for people of color, often unintentionally often unintentionally, right? Out of sight, out of mind, that this is, why, this is where the having diversity, this is where having policies and practices that help create barriers and buffers to status quo and bias are really important. So how does it work? So something happens, we have, there's, we see this all the time, though we see something on the news that's associated with this stuff, right? Or someone has an experience. Um, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just what we're seeing on the surface. And what usually happens is that there's actually a pattern of behavior, a pattern of actions over time um, across different um, institutions, organizations, and individuals. And it's rooted in prejudice and bias, right? And we know that that prejudice and bias is subconscious. We know that that prejudice, and, and, and there's the exceptions, right? Those random individual racists that you pluck in, uh, you know, those folks that we talked about earlier. Um, but they're really rooted in these stereotypes and mental models of who people are and how people navigate the world. And it determines the assumptions we make about people. And it isn't, this is uh, probably one of the most, um, most important points um, is that it determines the assumptions we make about people and what they have, what they should have, what they don't have, what they care about, right? We make a lot of assumptions and they're rooted in these deep-seated thoughts about who other people are when we think about what a community is. And it determines what happens in, um, in organizations. There's also this historical and social context. We know that we have a long history in this country of policies and practices that led to the inequities we see today. Long history, starting from the Social Security Administration being developed and us getting access to um, the ability to retire with some support. We know that that policy when it first came out was exclusive. People of color were not allowed to retire with money. So these are the things we don't generally learn about, but that are very much at the root of our, thank you, at the root of our um, uh, reasons why we see many of the inequities today. So there's the personal responsibility. There's also a larger social context that we really need to be cognizant of and be respectful of so that we can make better decisions and choices um, and not follow the same patterns of exclusion. And then how it plays out in our cultures, in our, our kind of cultural practices and institution, institutions. And so this is again where those policies are really important. So this is where we get to racial equity. And all we're saying here is that people get what they need, that we're closing the gap so that your race is not the primary determinant of whether or not you are successful. And that is the reality for um, many people. Um, and so when we talk about equity, we're really talking about how do we make sure that we are proactively looking at policies and practices and we have measures and we're constantly looking at how we're going to close those gaps. And it's an ongoing um, effort. And so when we talk about equity, we're not talking about equality, we're talking about equity, which is different. So I'm gonna share this with you. For those who are way over there in the back, I'll read it for you, I usually don't read it. Um, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And there's a picture of an elephant, a penguin, an elephant, a goldfish, a seal, a dog, right? And so that's equality. That's asking everyone to do the same thing. That's giving everyone the same thing, right? Which is different from equity. When we talk about equity, oh wait, someone wants to take a picture, hold on. Okay. We're really talking about giving people what they need to achieve the desired outcome. That's what we're talking about. So this is just a different take on the one where the kids are behind the fence. Um, and so what I'm going to do for time's sake is talk about how this plays out in the resilient strategy. So I I've given you some framing 
and I've talked about some things that are pretty controversial, but I think are important for us to have real, honest conversations. Um, and what the way it played out in terms of the engagement is that came up over and over and over again, that meaning racism came up as in something that we needed to have a better conversation around, something that we needed to really confront and figure out what we are proactively going to do about it. No, we did not create the circumstances and the long history of policies and practices, but yes, we own it because it is, there's no one else gonna show up to come and do it, right? It's us who are gonna have to be responsible for taking things, taking this work on. So the cross-cutting theme is um, advancing racial equity and strengthening social cohesion. So the connectivity, um, someone earlier said that social, um, the relationships in communities was really important. The gold star, where's my gold star? Oh, there you go, gold star. So gold star, you're important because when the research around resilience and who does the best after um, emergencies happen in terms of cities and, um, and communities, it's those that have strong social cohesion. And one of the barriers to us having that is racism. So we have to be able to op have these open up our hearts, open up our minds to be able to go there so that we can have stronger social cohesion and not let that be a barrier. Then we have how we're going to integrate the work that we do into policies and practices in government um, and our, our share that, that work with our um, uh, other stakeholders across the city. Uh, household economic resilience, um, this gets to the wealth gap. Critical infrastructure resilience, this is the direct connection between Climate Ready Boston um, and uh, 100 Resilient Cities and how we connect the dots across um, the way we're looking at climate change, impact on infrastructure and how it's going to impact the most vulnerable communities. Um, community governance resilience, this gets to community voices being at the forefront, right? That community should be at the table for decisions being made about what's happening in them. And then this last piece is around community psychological resilience. This gets to the mental health piece. This gets to what we need as individuals to maintain our well-being as well as what happens when there's trauma, both from the disaster type stuff, as well as what's happening in communities. So I gave you the quick down and dirty rundown. I wish we had more time together to kind of go through more of this. But and so they are in all of the ones on the right hand side, there are anchored in this idea of us asking those additional questions of are we causing any harm to communities by doing this work um, and making sure that the, we're focused on how do we make sure we're advancing racial equity and strengthening relationships between people within the city of Boston. So I'll leave you with this because it is my favorite quote and I show it in every presentation I ever give. And that is most people don't recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. There's a lot of work to be done and we need each other to do this work both in terms of the social stuff, but in terms of the physical environment, and how we think about design, how we think about the way we approach who's at the table as we're kind of thinking through these designs, um, and how do we make sure that there's a community process? How do we make sure that we're not allowing assumptions to steer us in a direction that might not be aligned with what the reality of communities are? I didn't ask Larita to ask that question, but the question was, are any of the 99 other cities that are part of 100 Resilient Cities taking this on in this way? And the answer is no. Um, we do have a, a, a great um, report that came out um, it was from Berkeley where they touched on it, and so they're, they're kind of scratching the surface. Um, so this is the first resilient strategy that really anchors in these big, um, in, in this issue of racial equity and strengthening social cohesion. Um, so with that said, I'm going to be quiet and hand it back over to Rebecca. Thanks, Dr. Martin. So can we ask you a couple of questions? Since you have to go? Yeah, yeah. So uh, since Dr. Martin has to go, we wanted to see if anyone had a couple of questions for her before she heads out. Katie. So there isn't one that says, oh, sorry. So the question is, um, is there a scorecard for um, how racist policies or practices are and um, how does Boston compare? So there isn't a scorecard and I'd be kind of cautious of that because the, again, when we start to t use words like racist, it then leads directly to individuals. But this idea of, are we advancing racial equity is a different question. 
Um, and so there isn't necessarily a scorecard, but there is a framework that um, we're going to be leveraging in the city that we'll be sharing with folks, which is through the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, and the Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a network of cities and counties around the country who are really looking at how do you operationalize equity? What does that mean for policy and practice? Um, and so there's a series of questions and there's a framework and toolkit that um, cities around the country um, have signed on and committed to using, including Boston. We're actually the first city on the East Coast to sign on, I, I, if you could believe that. Um, so if we look at specific issue areas, though, there are some measures, right? So if we look at um, issues around income inequality, Boston was ranked number one by the Brookings Institute for income inequality. Um, when we look at wealth and we look at that broken down by race, we know that the color of wealth report um, that came out through the Federal Reserve Bank highlights the, <coughs> excuse me, the huge inequities between wealth um, across races, and it's very stark, uh, like $8 versus $100,000 of wealth um, between, um, in, in that case, they use the two extremes um, uh, on average black communities and white communities. So there's some work that we have to do, and again, a lot of that's rooted in policies and practices that led to um, who had access to different opportunities um, and resources. So I'm going to be quiet now officially, or are we taking more questions? More, one more question, two more questions? Yes, sir. I don't know yet because that it just happened, the decision was just made, and we haven't had, I personally haven't been in conversations yet around how do we navigate that terrain and how do we leverage it as an opportunity to make sure we're leveraging this resilience and racial equity lens um, as part of the, the work um, and how what happens with us hosting that. Um, so I don't have an answer for you, but hopefully we'll have some for you here shortly as we reconnect in, internally on how we're gonna navigate that. Thank you for asking that. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. So I agree that we should definitely be explicitly calling those types of things out. And, and so there's an opportunity there. Um, I will say that the psychological resilience piece is actually very connected to disasters. Um, and it, a lot of the uh, lessons that we've learned about how to support people when tragedy happens comes from the disaster world, things like um, psychological first aid and other ways to help people when in the immediate aftermath of when things happen. Um, and so, so I want to make sure just to kind of put that caveat on it. Um, but yes, absolutely, it should definitely be um, something that we figure out how to integrate and not be an afterthought. Like that's always my concern is it being an afterthought, which is why as we laid out the framework for the, um, when you look at the domains of resilience, that it's very much plugged into everything and not seen as something separate because that's where we get ourselves into trouble. It's how what happens in emergency management. It's like that other section at the end of the thing that someone added on later that no one ever looked at. Um, and, and it happens a lot in, in real life and more kind of daily things. So how do we make sure that we, if we incorporate, if we add something on that it is infused into everything. So thank you for that. All right. Me in thanking Dr. Martin. Thank you. As we look to the future, uh, as you start on the left, it really gets into the energy we use, what kind of energy we use, and how we're using it. And that affects the different emissions. And those emissions are going to change our impacts in terms of all of these implications of sea level rise and storms and precipitation.